Welcome, film fans, to another episode of Halloween Victories, where we're here to talk about the real monsters, studio executives. <laughs> I'm your host, Matt Presents, joined as always by my spooky co-host. Have I done spooky? I think I did spooky last year. My spooky co-host, scary co-host, whichever twice. I didn't use last year. <laughs> Which, whichever one I didn't do last year, it's spooky or scary. Alright. Uh, hello, I am the thing. You see how much easier it is when you just tell the truth? Just if you're <laughs> the thing, just say you're the thing, and everybody's day is going to be easier. Yeah, I don't know why he couldn't just, like, this movie, the, the, both both the things would have been, like, so much easier if the thing had just been like, oh yeah, it's me, guys, I'm the thing. Yeah, my bad, I'm the thing. <laughs> Uh, and and t- today for Halloween, we're talking about uh, t- two remakes of two movies from one of the masters of horror, John Carpenter. Uh, probably his two best known films, Halloween and The Thing, which were both remade in the late aughts, early 2010s. A lot of 80s horror just got remade around this time. This th- th- There was like a boom of 80s horror remakes in this era. Yeah, yeah, honestly, I, I was messaging my buddy about it, and he, uh, I because I was just asking, like, what do you think of these? Because I wanted to kind of hear some, what else someone thought, because I actually don't know too much about the pu- uh, public reception of these two. I knew it was negative, but I haven't heard a lot of specific things said. And he told me, yeah, he wasn't crazy for them. He did say the Texas uh, Chainsaw Massacre. He liked the remake of that. Is that one, ever see that one? I haven't, but there are also, like, three Texas Chainsaw Massacre remakes. Uh, okay. <laughs> It's it's kind of weird. Yeah, we're talking about Rob Zombie's Halloween from 2008 and um the thing from 2011. I'll tr- I'll try to pronounce the director's name in a minute. But uh Michael, why don't you start us off by telling us about Rob Zombie's Halloween? Right. So, as Matt stated, directed by Rob Zombie in 2007, we got a remake of Halloween. Um, from 1978. Uh this movie tells, you know, retells the story of a masked killer who goes in a kill and spree murdering this girl and her friends but by the time each of them are able to pick up on what's happening it's already too late for them the twist that the remake adds in is that half of it is spent before the events of the original movie where we're kind of learning more about michael myers past and then Not the other half, half of it i'd say it's close like, maybe like there's a 10 minute difference between it's the two halves low, but it's I don't. I I feel like we spend way more time on on the Halloween stuff than we do the the, the flashback. I I think it's only. But like it is 10 it minutes. is it is a decent. It is a pretty decent chunk of the uh-huh. movie. Yeah. Um. It, it's. I, yeah. I mean. It's a. It, it's more than. It's more than thirty percent. It's probably at the very least at least forty percent. Um, that sounds reasonable. And what it also does to the second half of the movie, which is more you know, familiar to the original is it creates a relationship, a stronger connection between Michael Myers and the main girl, um, with them being related. Uh, these are changes that are questionable, now, but at the same time add something. Uh, so for I, like, I, know, I, a purpose I, to be a remake, go ahead. I do have to step in there. Halloween two establishes that, uh, Lori and Michael are related in the mm. original movies. It okay. is not in Halloween 1, and in fact, uh, the, the more recent Halloween sequels, Halloween, Halloween Kills, and Halloween Ends, pretty much discard that piece of information. She's okay. not related to Michael anymore. It, Halloween has, like, so many fucking timelines, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's I, ridiculous. I guess to offer, like, my perspective on this, just for anyone listening, um, I have seen two Halloween movies, this one and the original. So I actually, yeah, I don't know much about the whole lore of the series. I did not know that. Uh, so yeah, okay, then that's that's new in the sense that it's cover it in the first movie, I guess. That's about it. Matt, what did you think of this movie? I don't like it. I did, I here's the thing, like a couple of years ago, like a lot of, like probably my first or second year on YouTube, I went through all of the Halloween, Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street movies with my friends. And this one I ranked dead last because I I was just so upset with it. On a rewatch, I don't hate it as much as I did the first time. Honestly, I was mostly just bored by it. Like, the, yeah. the first chunk of it 
I, I I don't think is terribly well done. I, I don't feel like Michael... Michael's a character who really doesn't work with, like, a more sympathetic backstory. Like, the idea of Michael is that he's just, like, this embodiment of pure evil. Yeah. Right? And, like... Okay, I get I get the trope of like trying to make the the villain a little more human, a little more sympathetic. But in Michael Myers' case, I think he works so much better as a villain when it's like, no, he is just pure evil. That it, there is nothing behind the mask. It is all evil. And then and then later, the second chunk of the film, it's just Halloween but worse. The characters are more obnoxious. Some of the kills are, like, a little better than the original. It gets a little grislier than the original, but not even, like, by enough for me to care. Mm -hmm. I It's it's just the weaker version of Halloween. I think you've got a double-edged sword with this movie, because on one hand, I agree there's no reason to... There's some things that you don't need more information on. Uh, a sequel or a remake can go into more detail about certain things and sometimes it helps sometimes it helps to build a world or chain make like you know uh explore a character a little better than maybe an original movie did but michael myers is not the character to do that with i think most people would agree with that and but the other on the other hand the reason it's a double-edged sword is because i think if you don't add that to the movie it suffers from the same thing the thing suffers from in my opinion which is just a less good version of a movie you've already seen <laughs> Yeah. There's, like, there are differences, but they're not notable enough to where where you have to question, why was this movie made? Um, so this one, I, I think I know why The Thing 2011 was made. I think I can kind of get into their headspace, which we'll talk about when we get to that one. With this movie, though, it's a, way, it's a lot more blatant. It's just like, okay, they wanted to do a Halloween remake where they explored Michael a little bit more, where they showed what, what the fuck was this guy's childhood like, uh, which is, on paper, maybe an, int- an interesting thought. But when you actually go and execute it, it's just unnecessary. Yeah, and it here's the thing: this feels like so like the studio was already set on remaking Halloween, and Rob Zombie is like, I cannot let them fuck up a Halloween remake. Uh-huh. So Rob Zombie steps in and he's like, I'll do it. I'll do the Halloween remake for you guys. And I don't know that that was a good choice. Um, now I showed you Lords of Salem ahead of this. Yes. Uh, that, that'll, there'll be an out of the ring on that on the second channel coming soon. But I just, I, I like Rob Zombie. He is a, a director I think it's a lot of shit, in part because he made this movie. I feel like Halloween is just not a story he is fit to tell, right? The original Halloween is a very subtle horror movie, and Rob Zombie really doesn't do subtle well. Yeah. So, I I appreciate his attempt. I appreciate that he was trying to keep this from being some just bland corporate remake like The Thing, but it's not a movie he was fit to do. Honestly, I'd honest I'd probably rather see Rob Zombie's The Thing <laughs> just personally. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I could see that. Um I I guess to give my thoughts, I think that I Hate is too strong of a word for me to give this movie. I think that it's doing things well, but I, as a whole, it's bad. And especially when you compare, especially when you get to that second half, I really wasn't into it at all. Like I thought it lost anything that was interesting just because it's like, I saw this before it was done better than the other one. Yeah. I, here's the thing, even just comparing like the portion of this movie, that's a lame remake of Halloween to the lame remake of the thing. This does so much worse because I think Lori and her friends in this are kind of obnoxious, I which agree. they were not in the first movie. <laughs> yeah, they were fine in the first movie. This one, yeah, I did, I did kind of not like them. <laughs> yeah, I almost every character in this movie, I think, is kind of obnoxious. I agree. The, the family at the start, holy shit, they're horrible. <laughs> that was like that was like kind of like entertainingly bad. Like how fucking awful Michael's family was. Um, I was laughing at those scenes with that fucking father character, but it was, like, a horribly written character. Like, I mean, just completely tasteless nonsense. But it was funny to me. It was funny to me, especially since he dies so early on. <laughs> so, it, yeah, the, char- the character's kind of pissing you off, but at the same time, yeah, you get to see him die. I don't know, that's the, the psychopath yeah, that's in you the- gets to... <laughs> I, I don't know. He he made very deliberately obnoxious characters so you'd be rooting for them to die, but yeah. like 
Still, you gotta sit through them being an obnoxious character to get to that. Yeah, and um, and even then, sometimes like a, like an effective death in a horror movie comes more so when it is happening to a character that you don't think deserves it. Because that's why it's a horror movie. It's uncomfortable with this. It's just like, yeah, thank God. Thank God. Like, maybe it's okay to have one of those or one or two of those in a movie. I don't know if you want every single character to be like that. Yeah. There there were there were two characters I did sympathize with, though, in the movie. Where I didn't want them to go. Um, one of them, and I'm being serious here. I don't. This might be something that other people thought was stupid. I, I actually felt bad for him. Uh, Danny Trejo's character. Yeah. He, because he is good to Michael. He is, like, nice to this kid who's in this horrible situation. Um, And you kind of, like, get this thought that maybe once it comes to Michael approaching him, he's just going to walk away. And I think that actually is a good way this movie established Michael as a psychopath, where it's like he gets no special treatment once it's, like, his time to encounter Michael. Like, none at all. You could even argue that the death that Michael gives him is worse than the other people just because he thought he was going to be let off easy. And I felt genuinely sorry for him during that scene where he's like begging and saying, I was good to you, Michael. I was good to you. They also threw in that fucking bullshit line about him retiring. <laughs> like, it was his last day. Like, come on. I think it was three months. And that's, and that's why you don't make every character an irredeemable piece of shit. Yeah. Right? Because when they're not an irredeemable piece of shit, it, like their death is like, oh, hey, that's like, actually terrifying michael really is a soulless killer yeah so that was when he kills the dad it's like yeah i'd fucking kill that dude too (laughs) fuck him yeah um and yeah that's and that that probably is like the best that's the second best character in the movie the best one who i'm also he tragically went too soon is big joe grizzly <laughs> who I wish was I, I wish he was the one going after Michael in the movie and not Malcolm McDowell, who does good with what was given to him, I feel like he's a very good actor. It's just I don't really care for that yeah. character, and I especially don't care that he continued to be in the movie after the beginning of it. I think he should have just died at the hospital with everyone else. I think he is a more obnoxious Dr. Loomis than Donald Pleasance was in the first movie, but I do think he is one of the few characters that I'm like, okay, I don't hate you. Yeah, I don't hate him either. Um, I think that, I don't, yeah, but I just, I also wasn't, like, interested. I guess it makes sense that he'd be in the second half. It does. It's just, like, I kind of felt like I didn't really need this. I don't know. I I hit a point where every time it cut back to him, I was just, like, even more bored. (laughs) But I I get it. It's not like a, a ridiculous decision or anything. You should see the sequel to this where he's on <laughs> some fucking talk show. I forget, but he's on some talk show and the other guest is Weird Al. And it's like, <laughs> why is Weird Al in this Rob Zombie movie? The fuck? <laughs> King of Hall of Victory showed back up Clint Howard. Clint Howard. Thank God he's in this because uh, next episode we'd have to have some debates about who the true king is. And it's like, nope, no, it's it's Clint Howard. Clint Howard's the true king. Yeah. Still. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm happy about that, too. Clint, I, I want him to maintain that position, but I, I'm very well aware he likely won't. But I want him to. Like, I'm, I'm rooting for him. And once again, he was fine in this. Like, Clint Howard's never, even though he's the king of Hall of Victories, I don't think he's been bad in any of the movies we saw him in. Maybe one of the, maybe one of the animated ones. I Like, what was it? Rhapsody Street Kids. Rhapsody Street Kids. I don't remember who he voices. I can't, I, I don't remember any of those voices being good, though. <laughs> uh, we, we should just, like, it, next time we have, like, some time to do an Out of the Ring, we should just do, like, an Out of the Ring on uh, The Ice Cream Man starring Clint Howard. Hell yeah. Just just to be like, ah, yeah, King of Hollow Victory is his, one of his few starring roles. Yeah, let, well, let's just do it in a month where we don't have an idea for a Out of the Ring connection. <laughs> I mean, that I, I, we don't do it for every episode anyway. Yeah, and uh, we could throw it in there as eventually. I guess, do you want to talk about cast since we're talking about Clint Howard? Yeah, is there anything else about just the movie as a whole you would want to say first? Because uh, I... Uh, I, I've got like one I, more thing, but it can wait until we get to that actor. Yeah, I don't know. As, as a whole, I, I I really don't think much of the film. Not so. poorly made. Not poorly made. There's like no. I uh, that's that's the thing. I I did say this in the out of the ring, but I I do have to compliment the visuals in this movie. Yeah. Like it's a well shot movie, and <laughs> like they 
they get the Michael Myers mask right, it looks yes. scary in this one, which it doesn't in some of the sequels. They oh. get the mask, like, way off in some of the sequels. I also think that, like, um, the Michael Myers, like, you know, prisoner Michael Myers without the mask when he's an adult... I think they that visual does work pretty well. I again, I, I do think all of this backstory isn't necessarily necessary, <laughs> but I I do think like just the really long hair draping down the fact that he's not wearing a mask, but you still don't see what his face looks like. Some of the angles they get at, I, I think they made him look really intimidating. Like this is a guy you don't want to fuck with. When the people who transport prisoners hear that they're gonna they're they have to transport Michael Myers, they're all just kind of like. Shit, especially when they were just having a conversation about the job, like, and how some of them aren't that crazy for it. So I felt like the some of those scenes worked pretty well. Some of that, like, just that visual of him uh, worked as, like, an alternative alternative costume for Michael Myers in Smash Bros., you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I do kind of like some of the stuff in his back. I Like, here's the thing. All the stuff leading up to him going to the, the asylum, I'm kind of like... No, I'm not into the... Like, I think it's better that he just randomly kills his sister for no reason and we get no yeah. backstory as to why that happened. But once he's at the asylum, I'm like, okay, this is a part of his backstory I'm interested in in exploring a little. Yeah. I, I kind of like that Dr. Loomis is sort of using him, like, for his own ends. Like, he's, he's writing a book about Michael, and it's like, oh, the, these are the eyes of a killer. He's so terrible. And I, I, I like all the bits of, like, Michael, like, making his own mask, and like, oh, this is my real face. It's all darkness. Yeah. So and then, like, you see all the that, masks in that his bit, room. Yeah, that bit I think is interesting, when he's just, like, at the asylum. Right. Uh, ever everything up to that point, I'm like, I could have done without this. I think that the first, like, 20 minutes are, like, kind of so bad they're good. Like, I, I did just kind of have a fun time watching. It was stupid. It was obnoxious. Of course, you, you, you said it already, of course I want these guys to die. Like, first it's the bully kid who's as obnoxious as a bully in a movie can be. Then there's the father. They made the sister, like, she wasn't nearly as bad as anyone else that he killed, but it's also just, like, they still made her obnoxious. They still made her, like, a shitty sister. And again, like, I feel like with the Danny Trejo character, you don't have to make them miserable people to put them in a death scene, you know? It's a yeah. horror movie. You can have a sympathetic death. And I mean, I kind of get him, like, starting with the people in his life who are, who have wronged him. Or right. bad to him, but you know, I like like the sister is also obnoxious, and it's like, man, I don't care. <laughs> and what's so like good about the first one with him killing the sister is that it's like so. What makes it so unsettling is we don't know that she ever did anything bad to her brother, and that like he, it's like no. it's just that thought that it could have been anyone, you know, like there is it's that thought of like you can like have this person in your life that you don't do anything wrong to, and they still fuck you up for no they just do it because that's what's in, <laughs> something in their head told them to do that. And and something I think is very effective about that opening scene is it's like entirely POV Michael. Up until, like, someone grabs the mask and takes it off of him, and it's like, oh god, it was a little kid. Right. A little kid just did that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, where this, yeah, this movie, you know, no reveal there. I get why they're not gonna do that reveal in the remake, since the first one already exists. It's well known at this point. But, you know, it's just, again, some... Yeah, if the first one did it so well, that's my biggest thing with remakes. Either take it from a new perspective, which, be fair, this one did. Not the entire time, though. Or it's just a movie that was mediocre that you're making better. Like, there is instances of a remake being better than the original. It's not the common result, but it does happen. No. Halloween was great, though. <laughs> Halloween's a great horror movie. You don't need to... You don't want... You don't really need to remake it. No, and, uh, and I mean... I did say this feels like the studio was already gonna remake it, and Rob Zombie's like, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the cast... Scout Taylor Compton as Lori. She is so much more obnoxious in this movie, but I, I that's more down to the writing than anything else. I'm not going to give the performer shit for that. I think she does fine in the role. I just think it's a really obnoxious character. Yeah, I didn't really care for her too much in this, but I thought her two friends were worse than her. Granted, we see a lot less of them. Yeah. Um, I'd say the two friends were worse, though. 
Um, I, I don't know why, like, the relationship she has with that kid that she's, like, babysitting, sometimes it felt like it was all just playfulness, like, her teasing the kid, and other times it felt like she was genuinely kind of being cruel to this kid. And I don't think they balanced that very well. Yeah. Um, I kind I, I was so mixed on one of the decisions they made. And I even commented on this at the end. Like, I remember in the middle of the movie, she, her scream was, like, so high-pitched. I'm like, are they trying to make it sound like the baby screaming at the beginning of the movie? Because that was something that also struck me at the beginning of the movie. I understand that babies scream like that, but it was just so hype. There was something with the pitch and the consistency, like, audio-wise, where it sounded like they were doing something deliberately to me. And then at the end, it was confirmed by them playing her scream and the baby scream side by side. It was like, okay, yeah, that is what they were trying to do. I don't know. That was weird. I, I guess I guess I, I get it, but it's... I don't know. <laughs> yeah. On one hand, I don't think it's a terrible idea. On the other hand, I feel like it could have been executed better, maybe. I don't know, though, because it's, it's... I think it's, like, right on the line of I can take this seriously and it's way too silly. It's kind of like a questionable decision, but it's also one that I'm fixated on. It's not, like, really that important. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we you talked a little about T Tyler Maine, who played uh, Michael Myers, and I mean, like, he doesn't have to deliver any dialogue. He's big and threatening. He was a good choice for this. Yeah, looking at his picture, this is the first time I've seen his face. Malcolm McDowell as, as uh, Dr. Loomis. Um, Caligula. Yeah, good performer. Not a amazing character, but not a terrible one either. Just kind of a, I, I won't be thinking about this performance. I, I'll think of a lot of Malcolm McDowell performances, even ones I don't like. Bringing up Professor Cornwallis again, but this is probably the first time I've seen him play a character where I'm gonna completely forget that he exists. <laughs> That's fair. Um. Sherry Moon Zombie, uh, uh, Rob Zombie's wife, is in this as Michael's mother. I thought she did a good job. What about you? No, yeah, she's fine. Like, least uh, least offensive of the family. <laughs> um, there were scenes where she was arguing with the husband where I didn't think it worked that well. But uh, that's just because those scenes were written so obnoxiously. But the scenes where she is, like, devastated over, like, the her, you know, her daughter being murdered, but also just conflicted because her child did it, like, her son did it. Um, I thought that was an effective, uh, I, th I think she conveyed those scenes pretty well. Um, like, mm -hmm. I, I do think that there is something, again, not, it's not needed, but it, there is something interesting about thinking, like, what was the aftermath of the stabbing from the beginning of the first movie? Because it's one of those things that you're almost happy is done off screen. Because it's just misery. It's just pure misery. Yeah. But I think she executed it well. She's genuinely sounded devastated in that scene. Um, yeah. And then the remainder scenes of her and her kid, uh, you know, I, 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 I thought she did a good job. I thought that she, <laughs> she was trying to be a Karen mother to her kid, uh, but she also, you know, just fucking murdered her whole family. It's a little, it's a little hard to <laughs> be yeah. optimistic about this. Yeah, I, I think Sherry Moon Zombie is, like, a decent actress. I, I think it is reasonable for Rob Zombie to continue putting her in his movies. Right, yeah, because there are definitely, like, movies we've even covered on the show where they're putting their wife in the movie, and it's, or, you know, their significant other in the movie, and it's, clearly that's why they did it. <laughs> yeah. It's because you're, yeah, you're my significant other, which, <laughs> fair enough, uh, but it's also just, like, you know, that's not always the best way to make a good movie. Uh, nepotism, yeah. is that what it's called, or is that only when it's your kid? Nepotism. Uh, I think that's nepotism. Okay. I think, I'm pretty sure that counts. There's there's one actress uh, we gotta talk about a little bit. Danielle Harris, she was one of the friends, I think, one of Lori's friends. She was actually in the original Halloween series. She was uh, one of Lori, she, she was Lori's daughter. In like the in four five, and I think she appears briefly in six. Um, she plays Laurie's daughter, <laughs> and like Michael is coming after her in those movies. And those movies, here's here's the weird thing: like four tries to set it up like, oh no, she's gonna be a villain just like Michael, and then five is like, nah, that didn't happen. 
We're just, we're just gonna pretend the ending of four never happened. She's still a child. Michael's still the villain. Yeah. Which actually, uh, originally, I think Carpenter wanted Halloween two to end with like Laurie becoming the bad guy, and and they wouldn't let him. So Rob Zombie put that in his Halloween two. I actually, I. I, I haven't seen it since I saw the first one, but I, I liked Halloween 2 better the first time I saw it. I'm like, well, this is less obnoxious, there's more going on, it's more of an interesting deviation from the original. Right. Um, the One of the few characters I did not hate, that I did not find obnoxious, uh, is Brad Dorif as the sheriff of of the town. I think Brad Dorif is one of like the great underrated actors. He was in he was in uh, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, right? He, he's like the neurotic kid in that, and oh, wow. of course, probably probably most famously, he voiced Chucky in all the Child's Play movies. Oh, okay. And I j- he's such a good actor. There's like movies he's shown up in where I'm like, he is the only good part of this movie. Oh, neat. Yeah, he's the one sheriff character whose daughter got involved in all the shit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I thought, yeah, I thought he did good. I thought like him and Malcolm McDowell's scenes, like, um, yeah, he had he had like a certain personality to him in the movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he's like <laughs> he's like the one character who's not just an obnoxious piece of shit the entire time. Yeah. Not the only character, but, like, one of the few characters that's just not not just a complete piece of shit front to back. We do have... I, I know we said we were going to stop talking about single return appearances, but I think it's worth bringing up that Daryl Sabra, Sab- Sabara, the kid from Spy Kids, and John Carter makes a return appearance... I think it's okay to bring it up if you notice it. Like, oh, hey, this guy was in it, and this guy was... Like, I just don't think we have to force it in every episode. But if you notice it, feel I, I think we should be okay. I don't think we should have, like, a fucking ruler slammed against our fingers every time we do it. <laughs> I mean, if if they play, like, a significant enough role, yeah, it's worth bringing up. Yeah. I, I'm done digging through, like, the, the bit characters. Right. It's like, oh, this bit character was also in this bit part. Like, like, ah, nah. They were in this movie for two seconds, and they were also in that movie for one second. D. Wallace is in this, the mother from E.T. That's right. She's Lori's adoptive mom. <sighs> Who was that one kid uh, that um, Skylar Gassando? He, I know him from Righteous Gemstones. What? what, what yeah, who's, yeah, yeah. Who is he in this? He's the he was the boyfriend who got killed at the beginning, wasn't he? Or am probably, I wrong about that? probably. I don't remember. I don't remember seeing him, but this would have been when he was younger. Yeah, I don't think he was a kid, mind you. But he, yeah, he was twenty seven years old. So. But I mean, I no, he the was, weird thing. I'm, he was pretty young. He might have been one of the bullies. I'm I'm looking I'm looking at the cast list, and I'm like. Oh wow, they got like some big name, like Udo Kier. They got Bill Mollesy, and I'm like, I don't remember seeing these characters in the movie at all. There's so many characters in this movie. Sid Haig is in this movie, and it's just like, where? <laughs> I like even even Clint Howard gets like what, two scenes in this movie. Yeah, he's not in a ton of it, but he's he's never in a ton of it. I I mean yeah he might have more screen time in this than anything else. Uh, oh no 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 he definitely had more screen time in Barbed Wire. Yeah, but he has more ca- screen time in this. He has more screen time in this than he does in Cat in the Hat. Uh, was he was also in The Grinch though, wasn't he? I think he had a decent. He, role he in was that. in The Grinch. He had a yeah, like he a, was a pretty big role in The Grinch actually. So The Grinch is probably the most screen time we've gotten from from him. Maybe Barbed Wire. Actually, it could be Barbed Wire. Uh, one of those two. Anyone else yeah. worth bringing up? Uh, uh, aside from our, uh, our man, uh, uh, Ken Four as Big Joe Grizzly. Ken Forey. I, I, oh, yeah. That character was just so fucking funny to me because it felt like he <laughs> came out of nowhere. And it felt like he had this like big personality established to where he could have been a main character, but he's just in one scene. <laughs> I, I just don't even know why he was put into the movie, but I really thoroughly enjoyed his scene because of the personality of the character. He just felt like he belonged somewhere else. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I did enjoy that character, and I did enjoy that that character gets killed off, like, immediately. <laughs> yeah, just as a whole, like, there's uh, decisions in this movie that I can appreciate, but they're just overthrown by the decisions that I can't appreciate. The obnoxious write-in. And when it when it really comes down to it, the boring second half of the movie, which is mainly just boring because it's a lesser version of a great movie in every single way. Like, and those are my least favorite movies most of the time. Even once, even movies that like legitimately get on my nerves. It, it, like, if it's a movie where I'm just sitting there the whole time thinking about the original instead, I think that's like one of the worst movie uh, going experiences you can have. I think as obnoxious as they as some of it is. The first 50 minutes of this movie put this one way higher up on my my list of Hollow Victories movies than it would have if the entire thing was like the second half. Because I feel like the first half was at least keeping me engaged with stuff that was, again, like funny bad. And then just, you know, kind okay, like we don't need this, but at least it's something different. At least it's kind of interesting. At least there is a character or two that's keeping my interest. Um, at least there's some good visuals. I don't know that I really agree. I th- I think the o- I just find the opening part obnoxious. I'll grant you it is way more interesting than the second half. It holds my attention more than the second half. But uh I I I I don't think it's like funny bad. I just think it's t- t- annoying bad. I think it's funny bad, but I also was watching it with you guys and that's probably a large part of it. Like me and Stuart were just like fucking ripping on this family a lot. And that's fun for me. I, I, I could fully admit, like, this is not one that I would say, like, watch alone. <laughs> like, this isn't... I mean, be fair, most funny movies, like, funny bad movies are ones you shouldn't watch on your own. But still, like, I, as a group watching, this one was one of the more entertaining ones. Uh, but that's just because so many Hollow Victory <laughs> movies are just boring. Like, that's, what the, that's the conclusion I come to with a lot of them. It's just like, well, that was boring. That was really uninteresting. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of really boring and uninteresting, are we ready to move on to the thing? Yeah. Is this the one that you said there's some, like, behind-the-scenes stuff you wanted to mention to me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, The Thing, from 2011, directed by Matthias Van Heinen Jr., that's as close as you're gonna get. Uh, Naturally, a remake of, of John Carpenter's The Thing, although the ending sort of sets it up as, like, a prequel... And I almost feel like if you were doing a prequel to The Thing, you could have done a lot more interesting stuff than this. There's a, a team that goes out to the Arctic in the 80s because there's they found, like, this frozen alien ship. And they take uh, this creature they found frozen in a block of ice. And the creature escapes, starts attacking, starts disguising itself as as the people... In in the Antarctic base, or in the Arctic base, I, I don't know if it's the Arctic or the Antarctic, actually. I think, you know, it's killing them off one by one, and they're all getting paranoid and trying to figure out who's who, much like the original. Honestly, really does nothing that the original didn't do. Uh-huh. I, I, I said to you that both of these movies are kind of infuriating for different reasons, yeah. Halloween is just infuriating for, uh, because, like, the characters are obnoxious. But I specifically asked you not to look at any behind-the-scenes stuff for this, because I wanted to tell you this fact live on recording just to see how pissed off you get. Oh, boy. So you know how, like, the thing has, like, some of the best practical effects in any movie? And this movie just kind of has, like, mediocre CG? Yeah. They had practical effects on this film. And they see Jim. And the studio heads the studio heads looked at it and said, This looks like a movie from the eighties. Put CG in instead. Mm. And they didn't even tell the people who did the practical effects. They had to find out at the premiere. Oh wow. Not that I think that would have saved the movie, but it definitely would have made the movie slightly better. Oh my god. I have to, not only does that make me angry, but the one piece of credit I could give this movie is gone now. And what it was, it wasn't even a credit of towards it being a good movie. It was credit towards, I get why they made it. And I don't, I think it's a shitty reason to make it, but it was like, okay, 
the Halloween remake happened, the purpose for it exists. And, and deep down, I know, yeah, the reason to make it is money. But, like, if we're just saying, like, from an artistic standpoint, for what little artistic integrity these movies have, this one, it was like, they, because it's CG, they can go further with what the monsters looked like. It doesn't look better. It's not better than what the original did. Not even, like, fucking close. Not even a quarter of the way there. But um, it's like, okay, but they can go more wild. Because it's animation and you can do whatever you want with animation. Well, pulling a lot of this off with practical effects would be very, very, very difficult. Um, Some of which would be just be flat out impossible. So uh, I was like, that's the reason. Guess not. (laughs) Guess not. I guess that was an afterthought. Um, So, yeah, that no, I if I was one of the people who worked on the movie and I learned at a premiere, that would I think I would leave. I think I would get out of my seat and leave. What a fucking dickhead thing to do. What a fucking evidence of the producers behind this movie not having a single creative bone in their body. Yeah, no. Like, it doesn't... It doesn't surprise me. But even then, it's like... You already had the practical effects, though. Like, why would you put more money into doing other effects when you've already got... Like, who cares? So it looks like it's a remake of the movie from the 80s. What are you talking about? It looks like a movie from the 80s. It's supposed to. Uh, I guess, like, in hindsight, what you could tell them is, oh, no, you made it look like a movie when we want it to look like shit. Make it look like shit. You want to know what a great comparison I can make to this is, actually? I like to compare the two. Um, I was able to eat lunch while watching this one. The first one, no. Would not have been able to. This one looked like a bunch of plastic moving around. I don't I don't think the CG in this is awful, but it's definitely first it's not even like I, I wouldn't call it good CG necessarily, but it's definitely it's it's a million miles from the effects in the first film. Yeah. I uh I'll say this, like, cause I I do feel bad about like CG artists kind of being like thrown into this argument a lot because I think 90% of the time, it's not even their fault. It's like, they're just doing their job, and it's the direction of the film's fault. It could be the director, it could be the producers, of you're mixing in this animation that doesn't fit. This would look good in a video game. This would look good in an animated movie. Well... This does not look good mixed into live action. That's the problem. But in terms of, like, detail, these monsters had a lot of it. There's that, you know, the one with the two faces connected to each other where every single time they stretch out, it tears a little bit more in the middle. That's a disturbing thing to look at. But it's not blending into this world at all. Like, it doesn't look real. That's the problem. Because it doesn't have textures that look real. Yeah, and and I mean, another part of it, and this is, like, maybe a more recent thing, but I'm sure it was still a problem in 2011, is just, like, studios will use CG because CG is cheaper, because they can, because the CG artists aren't unionized, that they're finally fucking unionizing, so we might finally be getting practical effects in movies again. Yeah. (laughs) But, like, you you can just, like... Studios will just shove a whole load onto them and be like, get it done by May. And it's like, the f- okay. <laughs> and that's why we get so much shitty CG. That's why you get shit like Black Panther. Because <laughs> the, studio, the studio is trying to find the absolute cheapest way to get it done. And get it done on time. Yeah, and it's such a, such a fucking shame there too. Because that's like considered a monumental movie that's brought down by them, I guess, wanting to put their focus towards Infinity War. But, uh... Yeah. They're Disney, and they have the money to make both good. (laughs) Yeah. And, like, yeah, it's, like... I feel like there's always such a big, like, misconception with, like, CG from people who aren't, like, actually invested in the art form at all, because I don't think that... You know, I again, like, these creatures, designs, and animation from, like, the CG artists, I think if it was placed somewhere else, it would have been good. I think if it was in a video game... That would have been pretty impressive, especially for the time. Um, Yeah. Whereas being put into a movie, it just doesn't blend correctly. And yeah, I I, I don't know. It just the textures of this monster do not like match the textures of the environment. And it kind of um, they even have scenes where they're trying to hide it as much as possible with the darkness surrounding it. (sighs) 
there's one scene where they have a practical effect and it's the best like one of the best one there might be even more than one scene there's one notable one where they're just kind of cutting the alien open and they see the person inside of it like that was probably the grossest looking thing in the entire movie because it yeah they were actually interacting with something there was actually something there and that was probably the closest to the original thing that we got and it was enough it was just a prop basically it yeah, didn't have I- to it didn't have to move at all and that's like like the original is a film famous for its effects. Yeah. The thing has some of the best effects ever. And they they completely drop the ball on that one here. Not that they do better do adapting anything else from the thing, but like like there's so little here that I that I can point at and be like, well, they did that. Like that that isn't also in the thing. Like the few the few positive things I can say about this movie are all more true of the original thing. There is like zero reason to watch this instead of the original. Yeah, yeah, because like I said, even with like Halloween before, like I I agree. I'm not you know when I say comment when I comment on the first fifty minutes being more interesting, I'm not saying they're good. <laughs> I I don't think they're good at all. I just think that there's like concepts there that work, but. Hypothetically, if someone's interested in knowing about Michael's backstory, don't think I don't know why you would be, but if you are, there there's something for you. You know, there is I'm sure the movie has some fans, although apparently this one does too. And the only reason I could assume this one has fans is because they heard it sucked and then they watched it and then it wasn't as bad as they thought it was gonna be. Because yeah, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be either, but it's a it's just a bland horror movie where the original thing is anything but that. It's it that's why it's so infuriating is like is it the worst fucking thing ever made? Not even close, but is there any reason to be watching this? No, there's nothing. It has it has nothing. And especially if they removed all that hard work the people doing the practical practical effects did. Like, yeah, that's that's just <laughs> there's not even really a lot of artistic integrity you can get this give this movie. It's shot well. It's not shot like phenomenally. Like it's not great cinematography. Um, it's acted fine. Not a single character in the movie stands out. I think the lighting is actually kind of bad in this one. Like, when when they're all just standing around inside, it's fine. But there's, like, a lot of night shots where it's like, you know you can film characters at night and still, like, have them be visible on screen. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. There were a lot of nighttime scenes where it was especially dark and hard to see a movie. And if the darkness actually plays a role in the shot, like, it being hard to see things, like, play a part in the scene. That's one thing. Not really. They're just... A lot of those scenes are just them walking outside, yeah. looking around. No. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, like, some pretty poor lighting in this. None of the characters are written as obnoxiously as a character in Halloween, but also none of them were, like, I don't... I, uh, the one doctor wanted to continue research in this thing, even though it was threatening their lives. Uh, and, uh... The main girl was kind of talked down to at the beginning of the movie um, and took control afterwards. That's that's what I can say about the characters. That's the most memorable uh, notes about each of these characters. Yeah, I Joel Edgerton's in there and I'm like, you know, Joel Edgerton would do good in like the thing. Like if if you were if you were making the thing now, he'd be a good casting choice. But First, I I thought they killed him off very early, and he, then he comes back and, I don't know, still doesn't leave much of an impact by the end of the film. <laughs> like, I think he's he's probably one of the better, it's it's one of the better performances. He is a character who, who does some things. But yeah, yeah, I mean, no one, no one in this film has, like, half the charisma of Kurt Russell or, or Keith David. No. Or, or, honestly, most of the guys in the original. Yeah. Mary Elizabeth Winstead, I do like her, but not a, in this, she's, like, just really bland. And there's not, it's not even really her fault, fault. it's just a boring script. This movie and uh, the Halloween remake have my two, two of my least favorite community characters. And then we got Vaughn and Professor Cornwallis. <laughs> Uh, Vaughn oh, yeah. isn't Vaughn yeah. isn't like Vaughn isn't on Professor Cornwallis's level. He has a few funny moments. I just kind of thought his character was a douchebag. <laughs> I mean, his his character's kind of a douchebag as a joke. I right. do think there are good jokes that stem from Vaughn as a character. 
I like everything with him and Pierce. I don't like anything with him and Annie or him and Britta. Um, but him and Pierce's uh, rivalry was funny to me. I, I like the episode where uh, Shirley and Jeff bond over making fun of him. Mm-hmm. I do like that one, too. Bond was just one of those characters that once they wrote him out, like, I was happy. Because he felt like one of the most sitcom, like, regular sitcom characters in there, where I feel like after season one, Community kind of broke out and became something a little bit more than that. Season one's good, but it's not as good as where it went. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> in this movie, he's whatever. N- nothing. No, I, I don't have anything bad to say about any of these guys. I don't think a single character in this was like, oh, they're doing a he, shitty job. But he, he, hold on. What's the actor's name? Eric Christian Olsen. I think he's like probably my least favorite actor in this. Not that I think he's doing a bad job. Just like of, of everyone here, he's the one that I'm kind of like. Nah, man, that's just Vaughn from Community. Oh, he's a returner, too. Is he? Was, he? Uh, he was in The Hot Chick, I guess. So that, that I clicked on him and that popped up. Oh, yeah. Oh, we, we we talked about that in, when we talked about The Hot Chick, didn't we? He was better in that movie. Like, he's the douchey boyfriend in that. And, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's a more, a more fitting role for him. What's he doing here? <laughs> yeah, like, I, I got nothing out of him in this, but I didn't get anything out of any of them. Dr. Auric uh, Thompson as Dr. Sander. Uh, not, not great, but there was a little something to him. Like, just yeah. like, he was, he, he, they kind of made him a sociopath. Like, he didn't really care about the well-being of the other people there. He just wanted to do his research, and then he's dead eventually, and that's really all there is to him. But that's a little bit more than what the other characters were given. <sighs> very generic. Very generic. Uh, yeah. Um. I, I will say, like... The one thing I'll I'll kind of say this movie has that the original doesn't that they don't even do anything with like they could have done something with it and then they don't they've got like all these characters who only speak Danish and it's like okay this could lead to some interesting tension between characters who can't understand each other like hey, maybe this character's the thing, and they're not speaking Danish at all. They're speaking some gibberish. Yeah. And then someone's like, hey, wait a minute, I know you're the thing, because I know that's not real Danish. Yeah. They, but instead they just use it for stuff like, tell him to open his mouth, and then just open your mouth. So we're just adding steps yeah. to the dialogue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I do, like, all the Danish characters, I, I, I thought, like, the, the Danish crew was, like, sort of interesting, as compared to, like, most of the characters, they, they, there's, like, one of them who's kind of, like, super not okay with what is happening. Right. Um, I mean, I, I like the bit of camaraderie they have at the beginning of the movie, too, before they realize things are going south. Like, they seem like a bit of, a, like, a partying group, you know? But it's just, I don't think they I don't think they maintain that. And I get they're not going to be goofy as the movie goes on and horrifying shit's happening, but it, they don't have anything else to really like lean on after that i don't feel yeah and yeah like i i think that with a a ensemble cast like this you know you can really make them a lot of fun and yeah they you they could do something with the you know speaking different languages for sure not really i mean it's just it's just a bland it, it all just feels very bland it doesn't feel like they really did much with this at all yeah and like again i don't think they did like horrible no i don't I, I, it, like, I don't look at this and I, I, th- and think, like, oh, this is a complete betrayal of the thing. They did everything wrong with the thing, and I'm like, nah, nah, this, this is fine. I, they... It's just like if you hose down the thing, you made a really watered down thing. Like, the few times they really deviate from the thing, it's like, okay, well, the, clearly you did the worst. But, like, like, they can't just do the blood scene from the original yeah. Right, like, it's the iconic scene of the thing, and it's like, okay, we can't replicate that. So they do a kind of similar scene where they're checking people for, like, uh, fillings, for, for cavity fillings, and it's, like, just not as interesting, just not as suspenseful. Because it's not even like that scene leads to any, like, right, like, the blood scene, they find out which one of them's the thing, yeah. and then it's like, oh, fuck! Like, there's, a, there's like, a jump scare, and they're like, ah, oh, fuck, and they gotta, like, f- flamethrower the guy. It, it's also, like, a really good horror scene, because, I, 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 like, yeah, one, it's just a more interesting concept than a dentist visit, but, uh, also, 
it is kind of like they're they get the answers they're looking for and immediately they're like yeah fuck we're we're fucked right now we, we need to deal with this <laughs> it is kind of just like searching for something that you know is going to result in immediate chaos you know it's like that makes it so horrifying yeah in this one yeah you're right they put they they find four different people who don't have the fill-ins, which, as you even said while we're watching it, and to be fair, the characters acknowledge that's not really the best way <laughs> to decipher who's, because there's, like, other reasons you wouldn't have fill-ins. And they just go sit in a corner, and then the incident, the, the initial incident after that, doesn't even happen between those four characters. It happens outside, so it's just like, yeah, what was the point of that? It, it probably yeah. was just so they could have a scene similar to the blood scene that was different. But again, the blood scene, there's something kind of eerie about testing people's blood, you know? Yeah. Checking people's mouths. That's not really that interesting of an idea or visual. I And here's the thing. Not, I don't think they should have done the blood scene either. Just since it's like, yeah, there's all, here's the iconic version of that. You're never going to top it. But I, I think, like, you got to come up with something better than that. Yeah. That might be an instance of where what you were talking about the language could have fit in, where they're not even trying to recreate that scene in any way. They just find a new way for them to separate one person from the rest of the group. Maybe the thing is, like, speaking, actually is speaking, like, proper Dutch, but just, like, missteps on a few words, and at first people just think he has, like, a speech problem, but then he messes up enough to where they're like, okay, wait, hold, hold the fuck on. <laughs> you know, that, I don't know. Or, like, one of the characters who only spoke Dutch before says something in English, and they're like, hold up. This might be a hot take, too, but I almost feel like the very end of the movie where Kate murders, uh, I think it was Sam. I almost feel like it'd be interesting if uh, he wasn't the thing. And she just acted on paranoia, like she completely fucking lost it after the situation and just murdered someone. I don't know if that would have been a better ending or not, but I, I thought that's where that was going for a second. Because I didn't see him turn into the creature, but then there was the noises. So I was like, oh, okay, no, he, she, she did just kill. He was a thing. I don't know. I was just looking for anything to in intrigue me in this movie, and nah, nothing really happened. It was kind of a boring watch. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is, like, exactly the type of shit that, like, remakes get shit for all the time. Because it's like, okay, you did the same movie again, but more boring. Yeah. And, and uh, I know there are some people out there who are getting ready to, like, push up their glasses and go, well, actually, John Carpenter's The Thing is a remake. Is it? Is it really? Have you actually seen The Thing from Another World? Because I feel like you haven't. The only thing John Carpenter steals from that movie is the opening logo. He, he, he does the opening title sequence from that film exactly... And then after that, it's two completely different movies. Granted, sure, yeah, they're both about aliens killing people at, like, an Arctic base. But the villain in The Thing from Another World is a mutated carrot alien. He has carrot DNA. He looks like a carrot. <laughs> the Thing in The Thing can disguise itself as anyone. And that's adding to this air of paranoia, like anyone could be the thing. It's a completely different concept than the thing from another world. All he steals from that movie is the opening title. Yeah, if people, I don't know, like uh, the whole, I, I thought you were talking about something completely different for a second. Yeah, if it's like a plagiarism argument, most of the time, those are... It's not a, It's not even a plagiarism argument. It's, it's that it's a remake. They say it's a remake. I think there's like a book... It's called Who Goes There that uh, that The Thing from Another World and The Thing are based on. And I, I'm given to understand that The Thing is a little closer to the actual book. I'm also given to understand that the actual book is like a ripoff of one of H.P. Lovecraft's books. <laughs> <laughs> but The Thing and The Thing from Another World are two completely different movies. There are similarities between them, but I feel like calling The Thing a remake of The Thing from Another World is like calling Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards a remake of The Italian Inglorious Bastards. So many times I hear like a TV show or a movie is like a copy of this. It's like really just like a really basic argument that comes from someone who I don't feel actually understands film at all. Like, even like like some of us like TV shows, like some really simple ones, like uh, 
people comparing Herman, what was it, Herman's Mind, Herman's World to Inside Out. Uh, I, I looked at that show out of curiosity. They're not alike tonally at all. They took a concept that's been done before and went in completely different directions with it. Calling, like, Family Guy, The Simpsons, the sense of, sense of yeah, they both were raunchy family shows, sense of humor-wise, they have almost, like, no similarities. Family Guy went for more ridiculous and cutaway humor, where Simpsons was, like, a, like a satire of the, like, modern sitcoms at the time, saying what if they were a little bit more dysfunctional and, like, literally had violence against each other. Like, it's just, like, you don't, these are very these are comparisons, but these are surface level comparisons where it's like that's enough for you. Okay, good luck creating something original yourself then. Yeah, I here's the thing. I think at a point Simpsons started ripping off Family Guy. <laughs> Probably like Simpson at a point Simpsons wanted to be Family Guy. Well, even the show's creator has said that they said that Family like he quote was quoted saying Family Guy used to be everything we made fun of. Now we're basically the same show. Anyways, you have anything else to say about the thing 2011? No. Boring. Alright, on to voting then. Uh, and I guess I'm up first. Here's the thing. I, the thing? Uh, haha, the thing. Haha. I, I understand why someone would like Halloween more. I probably have more respect for Halloween as a movie. It's got more going on. It's got more of a reason to exist. But if I if it's like, okay, you're watching one of these movies again, I'm gonna watch the thing again. It's just a more it's 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 a movie I like watching more. Like there's there's so little to it, and I get that, but like I'm way more bored by the boring parts of Halloween, and the parts of Halloween that aren't boring are kind of obnoxious. So I'm voting the thing on this one. I am prepared for you to vote against me. Honestly, I, it's hard because I like Halloween more, but the problems in Halloween are so glaring to me, you know, where it's like, these are fucking major issues that this movie has, and I could understand uh, the thing boring someone, and I could understand Halloween infuriating someone. I don't know. I, I'm, tr I'm trying to be fair with this one because I part of me does want to vote for Halloween. I feel like I did talk about Halloween more positively, but I kind of talked to ha about Halloween in a more positive light where I was just giving it credit for the things that I liked. But you know how long those things that I liked went on? Not very. Like we're talking about maybe like altogether five <laughs> minutes of this movie. <laughs> and the other stuff was stuff that I like found entertainingly bad. So, I don't know, in terms of, like, making a movie with more dignity, making a movie... Pff, shit, I don't know. I'm actually I'm actually having a hard time with this one. I'm gonna agree with you on the thing. I think, like, in terms of making remaking a movie... <laughs> I'm gonna say in terms of making a movie, it does more right than Halloween. Because I think some of the things I like about Halloween aren't actually good. <laughs> uh, I think it was a more entertaining movie to watch. I don't think it was a better movie. I might change my mind on this later, but I'm gonna I'm gonna vote with you on this one. This one's a tricky one, though. All right, interesting. I was kind of prepared for you to vote Halloween. I was tempted to. I don't know because, like, again, like I, it, if I rewatch the opening of Halloween and listen to those characters talk again, I think I'd be embarrassed that I picked Halloween. <laughs> like it, it's just it's a hard it's a hard call because I don't think it is it is a hard call I think I agree because I I feel like these are two pretty different movies like there's there's one movie that's trying to be something that it really shouldn't be and there's one movie that's just trying to be the original and failing yeah I was gonna say I think of Halloween there was too many instances of where I had to make my own entertainment with it by roasting it with, like, you guys and Stuart and Mitzi. Um, and the Mitzi was gone for most of that one, but they were there for a little bit of it, talking about how infuriating the characters were. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just, like, it's an obnoxious movie, you know? I don't know. I don't know. It. I might change my mind about this, but it's too late. I'm going with the thing. <laughs> All right. Well, if you're voting for the thing, that means we are against the audience, although it's very close. This is one of the closest matches we've had. <laughs> It's 56% for Halloween versus 44% for The Thing. And and I get it. I get the split. I think, I, again, these are two pretty different remakes. Yeah. And so I, I get the people who are going to go like, nah, I'm I'm more interested in like the, the, the more original movie. 
I think there are, there are people who've like sort of come out of the woodworks to defend uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween after the the sort of boring sequels. Although I I liked Halloween twenty eighteen or twenty seventeen, whichever year it came out. It bothers me to no end that it's still called Halloween. I fucking hate. Why are we still doing sequels that have the same title as the original? Why are there three movies named Fuck Halloween? <laughs> this one, it's fair. It's a remake. Fair enough. Call it Halloween. That one should have been called something else. Ah. Uh, Although maybe it's a better title than H2O 20 years later. Halloween er. Uh, the thing wins. The thing mm-hmm. wins. Thing wins. All right. <laughs> Neither of these movies are as good as Things, though. I gotta find an excuse to show you Things, that movie rules. Alright. Next time on Hollow Victories, we're not, we're not quite done with with the Halloween stuff. We've got a sort of half-Halloween, half-winter holiday matchup, and we've decided we're gonna do it in Thanksgiving to sort of... Uh, in, in November to split the difference. I called the whole month Thanksgiving because that's what the month is. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing it in, in November to sort of split the difference here. It's, it's the two Adam Sandler holiday movies. It's Hubie Halloween versus Eight Crazy Nights. And we are being joined, hopefully, by the number one fan of both these films, Zatch. At last, the glorious Mackle and Zatch reunion. Hell yeah. You know, until the Oscars video comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Which one will come first? Probably Hollow Victories. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. QB Halloween versus 8 Crazy Night. I, ki- I kind of have a feeling of on who's going to win this one. And I kind of have a feeling I'm going to be in the minority. But we'll, 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 we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'll say this much. I am... I'm not going to say which one. I am a lot more excited to rewatch and discuss one of these than the other. A lot more. Uh, I actually have not seen Eight Crazy Nights. Really? Yeah, never. Interesting. This will be my first viewing. Interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> then uh, for my co-host, Movie Mackle, I am Matt Presents. We will see you in the next one. Peace.